Hey there everyone, this is Chess Coach Aaron, and I'm going to start working um, on a new opening, a new defense for you guys to try out. Um, three videos, that's what I normally do. And this one's going to be about the Petrov defense. Um, not as uh, commonly played as most openings, but it's a great defense for beginners um, to kind of get an equal position as black pretty quickly actually, fairly simply. And I love for beginners to use this opening um, just to get better at chess because it's so simple. Its idea is a simple one and it's easy to use. Simple doesn't mean worse. Simple doesn't mean, you know, just means usually a little bit easier. And in many openings, the more complicated ones, there's a lot of forks in the road, a lot of different ways to go, a lot of stuff to know. In the Petrov defense, there actually is only two or three early small forks and pretty straightforward. So we'll talk about that. The Petrov defense is named after a, a player who played it a lot. His last name was Petrov. Uh, he was a Russian player. And um, it's the opening, by the way, is after e4, e5. Your opponent plays knight f3 is white, most common start. And then instead of protecting the pawn, you play knight f6 attacking their pawn. And I'll show the position in one moment. But I also just want to point out that the Petrov defense, this is what we call it in America. Uh, this is what I called it um, growing up as I learned it but it's probably better known now as the Russian defense most uh, books and places in the world and chess players across the world call it the Russian defense he was a Russian player and he wasn't the only one to play it um, but he probably was the best known early on in 1920s and 1930s to play it um, his name actually is with ending with a V instead of double F but here in America we also change names we do some weird stuff we don't want to be like the rest of the world for some reason sometimes. <laughs> so his name was actually Petrov with a V, and we made it Petrov with double F. So really, Russian defense, Petrov defense, or Petrov defense. Uh, you probably can just call it the Russian defense. Um, anyway, let's get to the actual position on the board. And number one, E4, most common start, uh, starting first move for white in chess. If it's good enough for white, why is it not good enough for black? They made three pieces happier, right? Bishop, queen, and even knight has a new place to go. So three pieces happier. Well, if it's good enough for white, good enough for black. Then the most common number two move is to develop this knight and make a threat. Attack the pawn. The number one way, the most played move in this position by far is knight c6. If they can develop a, a knight to attack a pawn, we can develop a knight to protect a pawn. Okay. But the big difference is they're developing a kingside piece quicker to castle perhaps and if you're protecting that pawn with knight c6 you're developing queenside piece well you don't always have to protect something that's threatened right there's actually some options they're attacking a pawn they make a threat you actually have several different ways to deal with when your opponent makes a threat number one you can just ignore it ah, i don't care about that pawn take my pawn not always a good uh, strategy, but you can do it. Number two, you can protect and stop it. So knight c6 protects the e-pawn. d6, not played that often in this position, but it is one of the moves that are played regularly. To fill a door's defense, protects the pawn. Really bad way. You could play a pawn to f6, but this is a horrible move. You can move the queen out early, protecting that pawn perhaps. Again, bringing the queen out to a bad uh, square early, not a good choice. So the number one way is knight c6 to protect it. But you can ignore the threat, you can protect the threat, or you can make your own threat. And so here is the Russian defense, the Petrov defense. You threaten my pawn, all right, I'll threaten your pawn. You make a threat, I make an equal threat. Or in chess many times, if they make a threat, you can make a larger threat. Ignore their threat, and you make a bigger threat. You attack my pawn, I'll attack your knight. You attack my knight, I attack your rook. You attack my rook, I attack your queen. You attack my queen, I'll threaten checkmate. Go ahead and take my queen, please, so I can win the game. <laughs> you can always try to make a bigger threat. Doesn't always happen uh, that you can find to make a bigger threat. Many times you do need to protect. But here, this is the Petrov defense, and it's very straightforward. The idea is simply to match white, move for move for a little while, and get at least equal positions. And the Petrov when done right, it's actually very simple to get an equal position, a safe position. And many times, white will actually let black get a little ahead in development, so black has better positions. Well, the, the most common way to do it, and for most beginners, is to just take that pawn and test black. They will take the pawn. 
But they have some choices here. Taking on the e5, that's the number one. Number two way is a lot of beginners will play knight c3. They say, all right, I'll protect against your threat, and now I still have my threat. I'm attacking your e-pawn, it's not protected. And maybe they are used to the four knights, which is a very straightforward position to start a game. All the knights come out, everyone's fighting for the sweet center, and white has a small advantage because they get their first move. Usually the bishop will come out. But we, as black, don't actually have to play knight c6 and protect our pawn again. We can do a different move that I love. So if they play knight c3 protecting their pawn, I think the best move is actually bishop b4. Notice, all of a sudden, black is ahead in being able to castle. We've moved both of our kingside pieces. They have it. So black's already a little bit ahead in development for castling. But have we actually protected against their threat? No, we're creating our own threats again. They say we're protecting our e-pawn, and now we're threatening your e-pawn. You better protect it. And we say no. We're not protecting our pawn, but now perhaps we're threatening remove the guard, remove the defender. If we remove your knight protecting your pawn, we still can get our pawn back. Oh, and by the way, we can castle, get our king out of the way. So already, black is fine here. And we can look at more stuff, but this is just a simple way to get already equality. Your bishop is bishop b4. You're aiming towards, whoops, their king. <laughs> you can remove the knight guarding this pawn if you need to. Your queen can come forward, by the way, to e7 because your bishop is not on, stuck on f8. So many times queen can go to e7. And if the king is in the center, that might help. You castle very quickly. Again, get a rook to e8. Getting a heavy piece on this line can be important. And I say that if they remove your e-pawn. So if they remove the e-pawn, you're down a pawn for a moment, but you have a lot of choices, right? You can try to castle, get a rook on this line. You can play queen to e7, which I like a lot, by the way, in this position. You're aiming at the pawn. Uh, well, I said the knight, actually. You're aiming at the knight, but through the knight, you're aiming at the pawn. And oh, by the way, through the knight and pawn, you're aiming at the king. So you're going to get the pawn back. You still can remove the guard. You're threatening a knight. You're going to get that pawn. This is already a very equal position for black. Um, in many ways, black might even be a pinch better because the development is slightly better because they can castle. All right, so that's just early in the game, and that's if they don't take your pawn. Um, if they play knight to c3. Uh, they can do other things, too. They can play d4. They can play bishop out. Um, they can try to get castling, but already black has a lot of good options. You can do whatever they do. If they play bishop c4, you can play bishop c5. Uh, again, being able to castle is really important. So again, if they play bishop c4, they're just threatening this pawn. You can play bishop c5, and you're threatening their pawn, and you can castle. You know, this is good stuff. Um, and you're not worried about losing a pawn, because almost every time you can get their pawn back, no matter what. All right, but the testing move, the most normal reply is they take your pawn. They go to test you because, yes, you played your knight to take their pawn, but they're testing you by taking on e5 and seeing if you'll take e4. It's actually bad to take immediately. Yes, you're going to take it a moment. <laughs> but first, you want to get their knight off your side of the board. Get out of here, knight. Notice the middle of the board, right? This side over here is, let's put this green arrow. This side over here is white's side of the board. And then let's try a different color. I love making these arrows. And this side, whoops, is black side of the board. Now white goes first. So white has a small advantage. This is a natural built-in advantage of the game. They just go first. And black really shouldn't keep making the same moves forever because white always gets the first chance to do a, a check, a big threat, something that black can't copy, can't do the same move because they have to respond to the threat. White goes first. Here... This is already one of those cases where if black does the same exact move, they might get in trouble. All right, so if they take the pawn back and they don't chase the knight off their side of the board, get back to your side. If they don't do that, because white's going first, they have the first chance. Now that the E file is open, the E line is totally open. No pawns are in the way. White gets the first chance to put a heavy piece on there, a queen, right away. And it's not just that it's aiming at the king, but for a moment, it's aiming at our knight. And our knight's not protected. Again, if we try to do the same move, well, what's protecting our knight? They're going to take the knight. And yes, their knight's actually pinned, so we could try to get the knight back by attacking it. We could, right? 
but they're at least going to get a pawn. We could attack it, and we're not talking about check or doing other kinds of tricks for the moment. Lots of tricks. So this is already a bad position for black, but let's say it's pinned, right? They shouldn't move the knight because then they'll lose the queen. Boop. They protect. We take, and now they can take back with the queen or they can take back with the pawn, but either way, they've already won at least a pawn. And if you're not careful, right, as black, you might not even get the knight back. You're down a knight. So the fact that white gets the first chance, okay, the first chance to make moves in every position means black's got to do things a certain way carefully. All right, so e4, e5, knight of three, knight of six. And here's one of the few things you really need to memorize is the first three, four moves of the Petrov, and that's it. After that, just general stuff to know. So in this position, when they capture the pawn, this knight is actually a little too strong on our side of the board. We need to chase it away. Get off our side of the board. And they've passed the middle of the board, as I pointed out before. I call this the equator. The equator is the halfway point. And many things have an equator. Earth has an equator. There's different things you can call the equator. It's like the middle spot. We need to chase this knight back to their side. It's on our side. It's past the equator. It went to our side of the board. So we played, whoops, we played D6. This forces the knight to leave. The most common place for it to go is to run back where it started from. It's attacked, right? And staying on the king's side is kind of important. These were king side pieces, these two knights, one for white, one for black. Normally, you want to stay on the king's side early in the game. Make sure your king's defended. All right, now that we've chased this knight away, though, now we can take our pawn back. Snack. And if they try to pin that knight, again, white has the first chance to go on this open line, there's a big difference. They attack our knight. But notice, their knight's not in the way. So when we play queen e7, we're protecting our knight. And it's not available for white to capture. I mean, it can capture it if they want, but now that's just a horrible move. They're just losing a queen for a knight. Notice, if their knight was in the way, such as this position, our queen doesn't reach the knight on e4. Their knight blocks. It like shields our queen. And then they could take the knight, you know, and this would be a really tough position for black. But instead, we've chased their knight away, right? Their knight's been chased away. So that allows us, if they play queen e2, to play queen e7. There's really no other good move. So these are moves you should memorize just in case. This queen pins the knight, right? Can't move. If it moves, you put the king in danger. So this is an absolute pin. And if you go to protect it, and you have a couple pawns that can protect it, or a bishop go to f5... Because it's pinned, all they have to do is keep piling on the pin. Or have something smaller, such as the D-pawn, attack something larger. And if you protect your knight, and they attack it with a pawn, well, the knight can't run away, it's pinned, so they're going to win material. Pawn for knight, good trade for white. All right, so some of the things to remember in the Petrov early on is simply... They're going to play e4, you play e5, they play knight f3, the number one move to attack the pawn, and you don't defend it. You attack their pawn. You're actually accelerating your king's side development so you can castle. And the testing move would be knight takes e pawn. They're testing to see if you know that you should play d6, if you should chase that knight away. So they take the pawn, and yes, you want to take the pawn. Do not take their e pawn until you chase their knight away. And now... In terms of material, very equal game. Each side's captured a pawn. There's an E line open. Each side has a tall piece out. Now you'll notice here, and we'll just talk real quick, there's a bunch of different ways for white to go. There's like three forks in a row in general. Many beginners will pin a knight just because it looks so good. Put the queen here, pin that knight. Well, black's not scared of that. You just unpin it, and if they move their queen, making their bishop unhappy, you're kind of forced to do the same thing, but you're totally safe. Totally safe. All right, so that's one fork in the road. Next, they could move the D pawn and to two different places. I think most beginners should definitely move to D3 first, chase the black knight away, just like black chased the, their knight away, and we would run back, and now they should go forward. D4, and black should do the same thing, D5. Notice, the D pawns going to D4 and D5 are very important for both sides. You're trying to make all your pieces happy early in the game. And by the D-pawn going forward, both sides are making their bishops totally happy. If we back up to this position real quick, we've chased our knight away and we took our pawn back. So far, we're totally equal as far as I'm concerned. Black's doing fine. If white 
doesn't chase that knight away by playing d3, right, then our knight is in a very good position. If they play d4 right away, for example, which many players do also, our knight now, because knights are not fast pieces, is already pretty close to the king. And if they're not using a d-pawn to chase the knight away, well, the only other pawn left to chase away the knight would be the f-pawn. And right now it's behind their knight. So they play d4. And here's something else to make sure you kind of remember. This expansion is very important for both sides, d4, d5. The dark-squared bishop wants to be happy for white, and the dark-squared bishop wants to be happy for black. If you see white play d4 and you don't play d5, you're actually inviting white to play d5, and now your bishop has got a harder time being happy. And you've given up white a lot of space. The same for white. If black plays d5 pretty quick and they're not moving their pawn, maybe you keep going you take a lot of space and if they want to go forward to try to make their bishop happy which they need to do they might make the other bishop trapped and not happy Boop. depending on how they move their pieces so this is kind of important for both sides actually it's kind of like since the position is a mirror of each other the ideas for each side to do good moves is also very similar and both sides trying to move their d pawns forward is important so let's say they play d4 and you play d5. Suddenly you have a great knight anchored in the center. All right, so we said there are three forks in a row. One was many beginners will pin the knight, queen e2. The second one is to move the d-pawn, either d3 chasing your knight away first and then d4, or do d4 right away. But either way, when they play d4 as black, you really want to play d5. So if they chase your knight away, it's a totally equal position in terms of mirror. Both sides are the same, right? You can flip it over, mirror position. Or... If they played d4 in one move, didn't spend time chasing your knight away, all right, now you actually have a slightly better position because your knight has one extra move into the sweet center, and it's a little bit closer to the king, and it's hard to chase away. Now, the third fork in the road is actually becoming a very hot move for white. A lot of the top players are playing this as white. Now, have you guys heard of um, uh, Caruana? Now, he's an American player, and he played for the World Championship match. He lost to Magnus, but number two player in the world. Probably the second strongest player in the world right now, and he played a lot of the patch off as black. And a lot of the players play this move against him, the top players in the world, and he's done pretty well. Uh, he's such a good player, so it shows that patch off is a good defense. But here is the next fork in the road, and last thing we'll talk about. And that is white playing knight c3. They are attacking the knight, just like the idea of d3, which attacks the knight. But there's a difference. They're now offering the chance of a fair trade, knight for knight, and messing up white's pawns. White's offering this. But by coming out and attacking the knight, they're making black make a decision. It turns out there's no good way to defend this knight. You absolutely should not protect it. You need to either trade it away or run back home. Pretty much, if you try to protect it, you are going to lose some material. It's amazing. So even though the patch off seems simple, it's actually full of tactics. For example, if you put queen to e7 or you play d5, all this seems really pretty good, right? Well, let's say you play queen to e7, very common because you love the idea of discovered checks, discovered attacks. Coach Aaron says... Discovered checks are winning, and they are. If it was black to move, we would take this knight, discovered check, winning a queen, and probably winning the game here, right? Covering uh, e2 and attacking the queen with a discovered check, and we already won a knight, so this would be winning. But white does get a move, and now that this knight is here, there's actually some really, really complicated maneuvers with knights. And knights are, moves are not easy to see. So this knight, white does have a move, can attack the queen. And this is important. The queen is on the E line. Right now, there's no double check. There's no double attack. If this knight moves, let's say to say check, the queen gives a discovered check. Well, this knight on D5 would just take the queen. So white's already taken off a queen. That's not good. It's not what black wants. And notice, if the queen tries to stay on this E file, right? We have two other spots to go to. We have E5. Well, that's covered by the knight on F3, so that's not good. We can't go there without losing our queen. Well, what about E6? All right, now we're still threatening to win their queen. Excellent. Well, this knight that started off on 
B1, went to C3, went to D5, now it's just going to capture on C7, and oops, there goes a fork, and this is called a family fork, but more importantly, the black queen is going to be gone, and there is no more threats or attacks. So in this position, it turns out that this queen cannot stay on the E line. It can't go to E6 or E5 and stay here. It's got to run away, and since the knight's attacking the C pawn, it could go forward or back. Hmm. Well, these are not necessarily the best choices in the world. But let's just say we back up. And suddenly, their pin, which we talk about being able to pin with an open e-file, is winning for white. We can't put our queen back on e7 to unpin. We can't protect our knight with the queen, right? And because we can't unpin that knight, no matter what happens, they can always just move their d-pawn forward and win the knight for a pawn. If we protect it, boop, they'll win it. There's no other way to protect it and make it unpinned it's pinned here and if we do an unpin without protecting well of course they're just going to take so notice as we back up queen c3 i mean it's queen c3 sorry knight c3 really asks back a question what are you doing with your knight and you can't protect it one more time let's say they protect with the d pawn all right you take i take with the pawn and my pawn is all up in white's business this should be good but again now they pin and this knight being out makes a big difference. If you go to unpin, again, what's protecting this pawn? A moment ago, your queen was on the D line. Now you're unpinning for the knight, and your queen's on the E line. Now it's the same thing as a moment ago, except that white even gets an extra pawn. Attacking a queen, attacking a C pawn. If queen goes to E6, there's a fork on, on C7. If queen goes to E5, well, that's a bad move. You just lose the queen. <laughs> and if the queen stays somewhere protecting the C pawn but not the knight, well, they take the knight. So, it really is important to remember these positions, the first three or four moves in the Petrov. And after that, you can start playing chess. But, number one, a safe move is probably just to run backwards, right? Go back home, and now it's White's turn. And you're just fighting. Notice White has one more piece up, but White went first, so this is kind of normal. So, if you don't take their knight, then it's just going to be normal development. You get your bishops out. Your bishops are happy. Your pieces have good places to go, and you'll castle. All right, so that's fine. White has just a normal advantage of going first, really. But the other thing is, well, what happens if we mess up their pawns? Good question. This will be the last thing we look at. So knight takes. The best way for white to take back, the way most players, the top players in the world have been doing, is they capture with the D pawn. Seems a little weird because normally you capture towards the sweet center, especially early in a game. But by making this double pawn, the double C pawns, and this pawn formation for white, suddenly white's got a great place to castle. They use this as an extra strong fortress for their king. Four pawns in front of the king. Can't get stronger than that, right? And it turns out the pawn on C3 is not too bad. It's helping control the sweet center. But oh, it by the way, that D pawn that went to C3 opens up the D file. So queen will go forward. You castle long, putting this rook also on the D file. Lots of pressure from white. And where does black normally castle when they play the Petrovs? Normally they castle kingside. So by white castling queenside, now white says, all right, you castle kingside and I'll try to storm you. I can storm you on the kingside because my king's on the queenside. So these are some of the ideas of what white's also trying to do, perhaps. So just be careful if you're going to capture on c3. Just be aware of what, whoops, of what white's going to do here, which is they're going to try to castle long and maybe storm your king side with pawns and get space. But one more time, e4, e5, knight of three, knight of six, Petrovs. And here's what I'm saying to play. I think this is a very simple Easy opening to get started with to get an equal position like that and sometimes an even better position. All right, let's get one quick joke and we'll be done and look for several more videos. I'll actually do some games now with the Petrov. I'll show you some games and one of them will be from Frank Marshall. Great American player. He used to love the Petrov and he was an attacking player. He would use black with the Petrov, and you wouldn't think of it as being an attacking opening, and he would get great attacks. So look for those games. Let's do one quick joke. Hold on. Why did the skeleton cry when he was sitting at the chessboard? <laughs> one more time.
why did the skeleton cry when he was sitting at the chessboard? <laughs> well, as we know, skeletons are famous for loving chess. But in this case, the skeleton was crying because he had no body to play with. <laughs> Get it? Skeleton? No body? Huh? <laughs> uh, is this thing on? Woo, woo, woo. All right, guys. This is Chess Coach Aaron out. Peace. Have a great weekend. Try to patch off and look for more videos soon.